almost everybody is uh, in and preloaded with coffee or is doing so. So, uh, good morning, uh, Saturday. Mm -hmm. And uh, looks like most people made it back after yesterday, and this is great. Uh, it was a great evening, and uh, uh, yeah, it's just a pleasure to enjoy the community with everybody. Um, I have the pleasure today to both uh, give a talk and uh, chair in the session. It seemed to be easier that way, so uh, you know, without saying too much, um, I would like to start with a uh, with a talk, and um, and I look forward to the subsequent talks around uh, basically um, the status of the hydrogenability features as an approach to predicting outcomes. So this one will be a study uh, in, in the sheet model of the phenol development and the subsequent talks will be on the management method. The next talk will also be on sheet data and the last talk will be on the human data. So to kind of cover the, uh, a bit of the spectrum. Uh, so this is a study that came out of the last uh, time we had the workshop uh, with the team at the EMS Lyon. And um, I have the honor to pretend to be a PIS who unfortunately wasn't able uh, to come because of the, uh, <clears throat> of the virus that we all know so well today. Uh, but uh, he might be able to see us on Zoom, so if you do put his time, I hope that I'll, I'll do the justice to what he intended to, to say. Um, so uh, this is a story about, um, about the attempt to predict um, change in arterial blood pressure in a fetus. Uh, so it's um, maybe a little bit different from, from what we've heard so far. Before I go, I just wanted to, um, to let you know uh, that if you go to the website here, there are some data sets there that you, that you may or may not you know, find interesting to play with, and some, some code as well that I've been putting up over the past few years. So that, that's all I would say about scientific school of the talk. Um, so um, uh, the paper itself is uh, accessible here and uh, or for that uh, URL that you just saw for the picture. So you can look for details there. I do not intend to go to all equations, but give more the uh, angle from, from the physiological standpoint and hopefully from, from a clinical or significant standpoint. On, on the work. And I also intend to specifically focus on the aspect of um, what we call them, essentially the cardiovascular decompensation as opposed to the other aspect of the work which was also attempt to uh, make a prediction for the method, for the changes in the age and the basic success. So I will not speak about this today, just in the interest of time and focus um, the, the necessary slide. And uh, I don't need to say anything about this anymore because we had we had excellent presentations before that pointed out uh, the value of this. Or so I'll just keep over that. But just so you know, I have been playing also for some time with attempts to bring some of this to to the patient in different ways. Uh, and I think it's been a it's been a joy right to do so. Uh, so um, what is the problem that I would like to focus on uh, here? The problem is uh, really the question that has been around for decades. How can we extract information from the data accessible non-invasively um, about the fetal health that are really telling us mm -hmm. something about the reserve of the, of the fetus to, to, to extend uh, essentially the, uh, the labor and that are in time enough to be actually actionable uh, for the clinicians. So, um, what everybody knows well, so I will not really go through the details of this is, to date we have the history of many years of attempting to predict the Sardinia. Not only did that not really work well so far, uh, it's about as good as, as the toss of a coin. Uh, it also turned out to be really not the proxy that, that we really do want to predict in order to give a, a clinically actionable information to, to the clinicians to avoid the injury itself. So. The question has been around to find other other sorts of biomarkers that do inform us about uh, about the failure of, of the of the fetus to to extend the trial of labor, and um, so what this uh, shows is uh, 
is a, a model in the Prime Minister. Um, I don't think we have talks yet at that meeting, but in the, in the past meetings, I just spent a few seconds to bring you up to date. So the pregnancy sheet model has been around since almost 1960 or so, and that's the go-to model uh, for instrumentation of the fetus in utero surgically uh, to allow us uh, essentially to, to, to survey the fetal health um, through, the, through the cables that exit on the side of, of the pregnant unit for weeks, for months even and uh, to induce manipulations of the field health uh, in this way and look for, for essentially the, the cardiovascular activity, the brain electrical activity, the metabolic responses of the fetus to those interventions. And so what is usually done, and this is what was done here, uh, was to put an occluder on the umbilical cord of the, of the fetal sheep and then induce occlusions to attempt to mimic the, potentially the stage one and then the stage two of, uh, of the labor. And what you see consistently uh, here is, uh, this is a timeline of about four hours, just to give you a sense. And so the baseline and then the induction of occlusions of increasing severity and the responses of the fetal heart rate with increasing depth of deceleration over the hours and then, and that's the interesting part, and the advantage of the model is we also have the potential of the blood pressure of the fetus, the electrocorticogram, and the EEG itself uh, of all the fetus acquired at the same time. And so um, the focus here was to realize that there is a, an event occurring in this particular model of um, occlusions. Uh, and this event occurs at a, at a unique time for each of the fetal sheep. When we begin to see a particular response in, in blood pressure and EEG in the relation to umbilical cord occlusion induced decelerations of the fetal heart rate. And what that response is, is shown here in a zoom out uh, right towards um, the severe stage of the occlusions, what you could maybe think of as the stage two. Um, in, a, in, a, in the model it says. So usually when you have an occlusion that is indicated here by the increase of the, of this, the pressure of the occluder, you see the D-cell more or less exactly how you see it on the CTG. Um, and usually at the beginning of the occlusions here the blood pressure would go up. You see the hypertensive uh, basically pattern. But towards the end of the occlusions you start seeing the AVP decrease instead of in increase in the response to decelerations. And this pathological hypotensive response of, of the cardiovascular system of the fetus to the occlusions has a, a signature that's unique in terms of timing to the fetus. It's not the same throughout the, uh, the cohort. And it is also uh, something we can see in the change of activity of the ECOG and EEG, which I will not go into here, but there's some work in the copy if you're interested in the EEG aspect of it. The focus here is really just on the blood pressure. So what we did is in, 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 in this cohort of the experiments, we noted the time individually when we start seeing the hypotension in each fetus. And then we asked, are we able to extract information from the heart rate itself to be able to say when the time is in the fetus. So the notion would be to say, if you have non-invasive acquisition of the fetal heart rate, can we use that to infer the behavior of, of the blood pressure, which we usually do not have, of course, in, in, in a clinical setting. So uh, the first uh, series of attempts we did was uh, using change point detection approaches uh, a few years ago with, with Nathan Gold. Uh, from the European University in, in Toronto, and uh, so that system, and again, I will not go into detail here, just as, as a background, what we see here is that uh, we were able to build a model that's able to, uh, to make a, a, essentially a prediction of the time point in, individually from the RMSSD feature of the heart rate variability, looking at the dynamic of the RMSSD so it's, it's, it's one of the essentially simple metrics, if you will, of heart rate variability. 
uh, what was interesting was we asked what, what happens if we decrease the sampling rate of the signal to 4 hertz and compute the RMSSG then, which would be the setting you have with CTG. Well, the approach didn't work. And what we saw was at the baseline that uh, essentially the RMSST metric computed from a 4 hertz signal was uh, showing large fluctuations of the baseline overestimation of HOD and that led to inability to see the change point over time. And that, that's, that's the crux of the sampling rate. Um, so the question then came up, and so that's where the, that, that's, that's where the partnership came about uh, with the team from AMS was, could we engineer HIV features that are sensitive to the sampling rate of, of the signal that we have in, in the majority of the settings in, uh, essentially in hospitals and that are um, not sensitive to the noise that we usually have in the CTG signal and uh, that are able to do, uh, to essentially yield a prediction of, um, of the hypertensive response, although the sample rate is over 4 hertz. So the methodology, and this is a single slide of methodology, there's only one patient coming up, as I said. Uh, so it was just a slide in window analysis. Uh, the windows were set to this time period, under 20 minutes, with a shift by five minutes. And, and then uh, what we did was compute four, four ways uh, to express the project variability through the metrics here. I want to highlight especially the entropy rate, which is one of the metrics that we computed, which has something to do with the shadow entropy, but is particularly uh, good for capturing the changes of entropy over, over time. Um, and so, uh, again, please do look up for the for the details um, if you if you if you want in the paper. Uh, to summarize the findings of this work, uh, we saw that there is indeed a uh, sensitivity of such approach. Uh, for detection of the um, hypertensive response in, individually in, in the fetus despite the sampling rate set to 4 hertz, so that was really exciting. And um, uh, what was interesting that we specifically limited the features in terms of ability to capture only the time scales that are appropriately um, basically rendered if you use the sampling rate as low as 4 hertz, as opposed to trying to capture the time scales that are shorter and that are essentially not well as to capture through the simple creative purpose. Now, uh, what was interesting uh, was that um, uh, with uh, a vector approach to essentially summarizing the features um, in, uh, in this form, uh, we were able to uh, develop um, a metric that we call the distance to a healthy state of the fetus for which we use the baseline. Um, before the induction of the occlusions. And um, so what that does is, is shown here. So this is again, uh, this is an example of, of the recording over the course of the occlusions, just like you saw on the, on the slide, in the slides on the onset. So here, as you see, the decelerations are increasing in depth. And this is the computation of the distance um, over time. And uh, uh, these are two examples. Uh, somewhat similar, I guess, in the philosophy to what we saw in the talk by Peter yesterday, where you do a projection of the distance metric to uh, a, a, essentially a two-dimensional state space, and you look at the trajectory of, of the vector over time, and when it begins to deviate beyond a certain point, shown by the circle, that's the time that we know, and this is the time that seems to um, uh, to be equivalent to the onset of the hypertension in the fetus. So, um, to summarize, um, uh, this approach uh, seems to be well amenable to uh, testing in, in the clinical setting, and um, it has shown also um, uh, a good uh, uh, basic level of robustness to, to the missing data, which I think is an important feature for the, for the clinical application. There is, of course, also limitations to the approach, as you already saw when you did, we made some assumptions. So the baseline fetal hydrate was assumed to be the healthy state. Of course, it's an assumption 
that is not always the case, as we saw in the medium again and again, fetuses may well be IEGR or otherwise impacted to begin with. And so we do have a data set to explore whether there might be a difference, for example, in fetuses that show oocyte decrease, and uh, whether the, the baseline state there is actually different from the fetuses that are basically, um, yeah, with an oxygen situation in, in, in the range of a healthy fetus. So uh, the other limitation was the, that in order to define the cutoff for the departure from the healthy state in the two-dimensional space, we use the data on the cohort, but then we use this individualized trajectory of the distance metric for the fetus uh, to compute the distance metric. So it's kind of a hybrid between an anomaly detection and individualized data with a cutoff that's taken from, from, from a population as a whole. And so that obviously needs to be evaluated especially in, in human data to see how robust that actually is. So, so those are like the, the key points here. And yeah, I would like to uh, thank uh, the members of the team that did the work, uh, especially to Stefan and to Nicola uh, at the Nesimio. They are able to come to do the exams right now uh, for the students and, and so we're very able to attend them unfortunately, and to Nathan, he did the early work um, of the thousand first data that led us to this point, and of course to Patrice, I hope that uh, the COVID will leave him soon, and that uh, we're able to see each other in the next meeting. So with this, I want to thank you, and I uh, look forward to the Q&A. Starting the day after the lovely dinner. Questions, comments, thoughts? Just a quick first response. You, you, you show the, uh, the blood pressure uh, in Zoom, but I, I didn't quite see the, the before and after blood pressure. Okay. You, it, I see the blood pressure in uh, compressed format. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what. Uh, no, earlier here. Yeah. What, what? This is this is after. This is the bad. Yeah, that's uh, the pattern. Bad what? What is? What is the previous pattern? What, what, so I, there's I, no decrease. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So the the hypertensive response, the normal hypertensive response of the fetus to feed the heart rate cells, I did not show here. Um, you basically, what you can imagine to visualize this in your mind, the normal response would be when you have a D-cell, if the blood pressure goes up here, there's a bump, then it decreases when the D-cell is over, and there is again a bump, and then it decreases, and this bump, the, the dynamic of, of the bump itself is, a, is, is essentially a function of time and the severity of occlusions, and it's really individual to the fetus. But of course, the point is we don't really see that in the fetus anymore. This inversion of the blood pressure response is, is, this, is what you say yeah. as a signature. Exactly. Signal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that is in contrast to some other approaches where uh, where one, one, one sought to actually induce a hypertension, lung blasting, and severe enough to cause the brain injury. This is not what we've done here. So we're, we're asking, we just want to see when the blood pressure begins to to change from hyper to hypo, but not necessarily, we do not say that the injury actually happened. We say we would like to see when the response is essentially hypertensive and just assume that that should be the time point to know as opposed to waiting when the injury occurs. So, so at, that point, at that point, the pH is still just starting to descend or something like that? It's around 7.2 on average at this time, but there is a spread. So, yeah, so for the sake of pH, and like I said, I didn't want to go into the dynamics. Of pH, but there is a correlation to changes in pH as well that it, seem, it seems to track with this approach. But yet, the pH is about 7.2 at this time. Okay, can you show the pH on the next slide? Um, no, I don't think that I think I it was shown here. That was the pH on top here. No, no, no. I think, I think sorry, I think it was, yeah, the there was. The black dots up there, it said pH before. Um, yeah, yeah, so. Not here. But, but. Anyway. Uh, but like I said, I, I didn't want to... It says pH and black 
Um, oh, excuse me, in that, in that thing, yes. yes. This one, <laughs> this one. So that's what yeah. I was looking at before, and it seemed to be low set. Yeah, yeah, there is a, yeah, so, so yeah, so the interesting sort of happens right around 7.2. Mm -hmm. But there is a spread, let's say not a bit, there is an inter-individual spread of pH values at this time point. Some theaters have set a pH of 7 or 4, and some have a pH of 7 or 3. So it doesn't, it, yeah. So can I follow on, sorry, with the question is also when you said the hypertensive response at the beginning, the normal standard response to the occlusions were mild, um, what did you mean it's individual? Can you tell me more about that? Because I played obviously with this data, mm -hmm. from, uh, but I, yeah, yeah. I don't know anything about that. Um, what, what I meant was that uh, the timing of, of the conversion of the pattern from, um, from high tail to high pole, that's individual. So we, we assume that it would happen always at a certain time, but yeah. in, some, in some cases it occurred even in the stage right around here, yeah. when the occlusions were maybe yeah. They, they, they were not essentially like a minute apart, but actually more apart than that, and, and yet they already showed the hypertensive response. So the question has always been for, for the years, you know, what is that phenotype that in some cases they show so early, and in some they can go for three hours and so they begin to drop. So that, that, that is, yeah, that is the instigator point. And one of the things we see with the Oakland data that I play with, um, that obviously the ones that start you, you know that, but yeah, yeah. so the ones that start uh, chronically hypoxic or kind of on the lower range, uh, they are the ones to fail first. But it's all individual, yeah. so there is no love doing the same thing as another. Um, so, yeah. yeah. It's very interesting, I love this kind of data. So. Yeah, some, some I remember um, seeing data on labor in a, a sheet model. And the labor looked like it was a sustained, and not much was going on, and all of a sudden there was a sustained contraction and out popped the fetus. So my, my question if, is, is my recollection correct? Because if it's not, then I don't need to ask the next question. But because it would relate to what goes on with blood pressure and, and flow uh, it, during sheep labor. Uh, I remember Bob Reese telling me that sheep labor was a good model for sheep labor. And, and um, because the pattern of uterine contraction and so much of what clinical obstetricians are concerned about is what's perfusion like uh, uh, during a contraction and what's the intensity and duration of the contraction and is there recovery and how long is the recovery and what's a pathologic recovery. And you seem to suggest, there's some suggested data, but this data suggests that there can be recovery but what happens after this tetanic labor contraction? Or is that why sheep are so tame? I mean, are they suffer brain injury? What would a sheep be like if you delivered it by a cesarean section before labor and uh, after labor? But these are obviously occlusions, not labor. And the sheep has completely different I mean, placenta to the human. Well, of course, it doesn't mean poor placenta. Have placenta. It doesn't have a, so it's not a discoid. It's not labor, it's occlusions. Okay, never mind. No, no, all right. I, I think uh, there's tetanic contraction. Yes, yes. All right. That must be affecting diffusion in all these non hemocorrhal cognitive around What happens in labor? Does, does this have any real physiological? I mean, I'm not challenging your experiments, I'm trying to get educated here. What does it, what does it mean vis a vis sheep labor? Delivery. So I mean, like, like you said, she, uh, the, this is a good model for really for the UAs, for the uterine activity or for, for the contractions, and it's, it's been often conflated somewhat. You know, we will tend to be excited for some of the for a while. You know, this, this, is, this is very labor intensive, pun intended, <laughs> as, a, as far as the model. So yes, I mean, we don't have the head compression component. Uh, what we do have is the morphometrical similarity between the U and the fetus and the, and the human model and the fetus. It's essentially one-to-one. -one. It's the only model that has that for what it's worth. And uh, the metrics themselves, the values of the heart rate, the blood pressure, the blood gas, everything is essentially equivalent to the human data in the quantities. And that's really exciting to see the correspondence there for what you know, that is worth. 
However, what we would need to do in an age team like his so far, maybe I just need somebody else to write the grant for me, is that, yeah, we do need to do the seclusions and then get the baby sours and then see what, how they do, you know, as labs. And it will be very interesting to watch. There is a logical continuation of, of, of experiments like these. Yeah, good Thanks, so, Martin. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Martin, can you go to the last slide? Yeah. Actually, I have a question about uh, the window. Yeah, yeah, I sort of, uh, I sort of passed it a little bit. Right, so you say short window can to be tested. I don't know if you consider to actually use multiple window approach and then diffuse all the information from... Yeah, so that, be, yeah. that would be cool. I mean, yes, yeah, so this is literally, this was one of the states where we said, okay, we're just going to take this window because it gives us enough data, especially from, from the entry to standpoint. Uh, but yeah, definitely, yeah, I would love to learn more about like, what, what could be done and to um, really um, tease out the spectrum of possibilities. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Comments? Uh, the, the, the parameters that came out of this analysis, are they based only on the heart rate analysis or are they using the blood, uh, blood pressure uh, to to scaffold a model, even if you don't have the blood pressure available in, in a clinical setting. This is FHR only. Yeah. This is really so we are doing a prediction of the time point of hypotensive response, the conversion, but we're only taking FHR only. So that would directly be applicable to the CTG data, if you will. Okay. And do you have any performance measures over? The population? Yeah, it's in the paper. I was lazy. I just didn't put it in. It, it, it predicts well. It's like I think most of the time points are, are essential on 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 point for this model. I think we had only one instance from 15 or 16 fetuses that we have uh, where the prediction was off, and the reason that it was off there was it's actually interesting, and I'm glad you asked me because it gives me a chance to go there is in this animal we did an imputation of the missing data uh, using this fly interpolation and we noticed that it produces a spurious increase in frequency um, at that time which leads to anomaly detection appearing at the right time point. So that was actually one of the points I made in the last piece of the slide and why I was asking this before that the imputation has to be enjoyed with a degree of caution. Uh, so, so just to tell you, yeah, yeah, that it's, it's, it's there and it's, it's, it's good. Okay, this should be, thank Martin, thank you very much for waking us up.